So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the How to Apply to Higher Training webinar. My name is Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Luke Baker, and I am the current chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee, or PTC, here at the Royal College. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today. And we have some great speakers. And I hope that the next hour will be really helpful to those of you that are thinking of applying to become an ST4 trainee, and for trainers that may be here looking to support their trainees throughout the application process. Before I talk to you today about the webinar, I would just like to do a plug for the PTC. And this webinar is an example of the collaboration that the PTC has within the college. The PTC recognise that the application processes and the changes can be anxiety provoking to you. We wanted to try and help you and support you. And we pitched the idea of this webinar. The college took this on and here we are today with it and I want to thank the college for supporting this. The PTC is made up of over 40 trainees from across the UK and we engage with the college and outside the college making sure that the trainee voice is heard loud and clear. I could spend a long time talking to you about the variety of projects that we are doing currently but I just want to highlight a couple. Clearly there have been big changes with exams and many of you will have experienced the new examination processes. And I just want to say that we've been engaging with all of the stakeholders to try and make them as trainee friendly as possible. Whether it is with the ARCP processes and the changes that have come about due to COVID, we're trying now to make sure that the ARCPs for next year, that the documents come out quickly to provide that reassurance that you need and what you need to prepare for. Whether it is with welcome events, and I'm pleased to say that there'll be an ST4 for the very first time, ST4 national welcome event next year. And was pleased that we had our first CT1 national welcome event this year. And again, we'll have another one in February next year. Whether it is the cost of training and a document will be released very soon showing you where your money is spent as you've asked for that. And we work across the faculties, making sure that trainees are heard. And of course, how could I forget the trainees conference? And I'm pleased to say that I'm very hopeful that the PTC will have its second annual trainees conference next year. And I'm really looking forward to that. I can only represent you, your reps can only represent you if you engage with us. So my plea today before we get on with the webinar is please contact me. My Twitter handle is Dr. Luke Baker UK or contact your local reps and they can be found on the PTC pages of the RC Psych website. Let us know what matters to you. If we know, we can represent you. So please do make contact. So let's now talk about this webinar. As soon as I finish speaking, I'm going to introduce you to our very first speaker, Claire Kurzweil, who is being supported by her colleague, Louise Birrell. Now, Claire is the head of specialty recruitment for Health Education England in the Northwest office. Her team have run the Psychiatry National Recruitment Office since October 2013. She's joined, as I've said, by her colleague, Louise, and she will be coordinating the August 2021 ST4 psychiatry recruitment process. And unsurprisingly, they will be talking to you about that application process in the first talk. And I want to thank them for being here, supporting the college, and I hope that that 15 minutes will be really useful for you. After Claire, we have Dr. Kabir Karg, and he will be talking to us about his experiences of applying to become an ST4, and his experiences of being a new ST4. Kabir is a general adult psychiatry ST4 in Southeast London. He's completed his core training in India and spent two years as an MTI trainee in Hertfordshire, during which time he became involved with the PTC. And thank you Kabir for being here today. After Kabir, we have Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse. Now Benji is a less than full-time trainee, ST6 general adult, working in North London with a special interest in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And he's recently helped with the Imperial College London's RCT investigating magic mushrooms for depression. He's written for The Guardian, The Independent, and his first book, a psychiatric memoir, You Don't Have to Be Mad to Work Here, is being published by Penguin in spring 2022. And he will be talking to us about his career and why he chose psychiatry. Thank you, Benji, as well, for giving up your afternoon and supporting this webinar. As the webinar is going on, I want this to be as interactive and as useful for you as it possibly can be. At the bottom of your screens, you'll see the Q&A tab. Please do write your questions in there. 
And those questions will be answered, hopefully, in one of two ways. The first way is through text replies. And I have a team of volunteers in the background who will be answering those as the webinar progresses. And I want to thank them as well for giving up their time to be here. That's Professor Helen Bruce, Dr. Siobhan Mathican, the Vice Chair of the PTC, Dr. Rosemary Gordon, the Secretary of the PTC, Claire Wynne McKenzie, the Careers Manager, and Catherine Squire, the RC Psych Training Manager. So thank you all for being here to answer those questions. Some of your questions at the end will be given for the live panel, and the live panel will be made up of the speakers from today's webinar, and I will be asking some of those questions to them for the last 15 minutes of this talk. Don't panic if your question isn't answered. We will do our best to answer them over the next couple of weeks, and we'll put those up on the college website for you to be able to come back to and view at a later time. So without further ado, let's move on to our first speaker, and I'd like, you to, like to introduce you to Claire Kurzweil. Thanks, Claire. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm just going to talk to you about applying to ST4 Psychiatry um, for the next intake, which is August 2021. Um, so next slide, please. So um, there have obviously been quite a lot of changes in the last year or so um, due to the COVID um, pandemic, um, but the recruitment process we're running for August 2021 is almost identical to the process we've just completed um, for February 2021. Um, it is based on what we used to do when we were able to have um, interviews in a face-to-face -face environment, um, but there are some key differences, um, which I'm going to talk about more now. Um, so the first thing is it's a single application. The application is called um, General Psychiatry, and within it, linked to it, all the posts in England, Scotland and Wales across the six single specialties in psychiatry and the seven dual combinations um, are available for you to preference. So you only need to apply once to be considered for all of the posts. Um, there are three sections to the selection process. Um, there's a verified self-assessment element. There's an online interview, which is generic across all the um, SD4 psychiatry specialties. And then we'll take your um, CAS score and use that as an element of your final score. Um, you can apply subject to passing full MRC psych. More on this later. Um, and just to reassure people, there is no distinction made between whether you're currently a core psychiatry trainee or not, as long as you're eligible. Um, so next slide, please. So this is kind of repeating myself. Just to be clear, this there is one application process for all higher psychiatry training posts in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, I think I've put in the next bullet point because I think it's quite reassuring. There are usually more posts than there are applicants. So certain combinations in certain locations probably are a bit more competitive than others. But overall, there are more jobs than there will be successful applicants. Um, so hopefully that means you'll have a really good chance of getting um, a post that you want to train in. Um, so next slide, please. So in terms of eligibility, you can get the full details of this um, from the person specification. But in essence, you need to have 36 months experience in psychiatry by August 2021. Um, unless and for a limited number of people, um, you can count previous experience in broad based training or via the accreditation of transfer of competence framework. Um, if you think that might apply to you, then have a look in our applicants guide just to double check. Um, you also need to be able to demonstrate that you'll have core psychiatry training competences by the start date of the post, so August 2021. If you're currently in a UK core psychiatry training scheme, then that's all the information you need to provide us on, on the application form. You don't need to upload any evidence, you just need to provide um, the details of which training programme it is that you're on. If you've already completed UK core psychiatry training, then you need to provide us evidence of our final ARCP, of your final ARCP. Um, and you can upload that and attach it to your application form. If neither of the above apply, then you can get your supervisor to sign off something that we sh which we call a certificate C, um, which is basically a document that maps to the core psychiatry um, intended learning outcomes. Um, and that will allow you to d demonstrate core psychiatry um, training equivalents. Um, and that document alone is the only thing you would need to attach to your application form. There's no requirement to attach any, any other documentation um, and you will also need full MRC psych by the start date of the post. Um, so next slide, please. So the MRC psych eligibility rules are a little bit different this year, and that's partly um, because as a result of COVID, then the college have changed their exam, exam regulations. And it's also partly because this application window is much earlier than it normally is. 
um, the application window opened this morning. It normally actually opens in January. So we've had to um, change the um, eligibility slightly. So you can apply without having full MRC psych. You don't need to have it right now, but you can't start ST4 psychiatry without having full MRC psych. So what this means is if you don't currently have CASC, then you need to confirm to us in the application form that you're going to be sitting it in January 2021. Um, equally, due to the college um, exam variations, if you don't have paper A or paper B currently, then you need to confirm to us that you're going to be registering to sit them in June 2021 for paper A or March 2021 um, for paper B. If you are taking either paper A or paper B next year and you're successful in this process, then your offer will be made subject to you passing paper A or paper B because the um, result dates for the exams are quite a lot later than when uh, we'll be making offers to everyone. If you've already got full MRC psych, um, then we're going to be inviting you to interview in January 2021. If you're taking CASC in January 2021, then we will wait until after we've got the results of that CASC sitting and you um, will be invited to take your um, ST4 psychiatry online interview in early March, assuming you pass CASC. Um, that said, I just want to make it really clear that once we get to the point where we're going to make offers, all offers are made based on your um, application score and so there's no um, differentiation made on based on when you pass CASC or when you get full MRC psych in terms of your interview rank or anything. Um, so next slide please. So in order to apply you need to apply via Oriel. Um, we've moved to a new, a new and hopefully improved version of Oriel um, and the links there. What this means is if you've previously applied via Oriel for core psychiatry training, for instance, a couple of years ago, then you do need to re-register on this new version of it. Um, the application window opened at 10 this morning and it's gonna close at four o'clock UK time on Thursday, the 17th of December, which I think is three weeks today. Um, but just to be really clear, it's 4 p.m. on Thursday, the 17th of December, and we can't accept any late applications. So please do allow yourself plenty of time to register and complete the application form. Um, next slide, please. So the application form itself is hopefully relatively straightforward to complete. You need to give us personal information, qualification and employment details. There are quite a lot of questions about your MRC site status, depending on whether you've got it already completed or whether you're taking more papers next year. You need to provide reference details, but we don't take up references until after you've accepted an offer of training. Um, and you also need to answer your um, put your answers to the self-assessment section, which I'll talk about more later. There aren't any white space box questions, so, so there's no kind of long bits of information you need to provide to us. Um, in certain circumstances, you might need to support, you might need to upload some supporting information. So I've mentioned a couple already: um, the certificate C potentially, maybe your ARCP outcomes, um, your um, CASC score details if you've already got them, that kind of thing. But the application form should prompt you, so you should know about it. Um, and if not, we'll contact you to ask, the, ask, ask for the further information. Um, so your application is going to be long listed. We don't shortlist um, anyone out. So as long as you meet those basic criteria, then we'll put you through to the next stage. Um, we might contact you. Um, so do keep checking your Oriel um, account after you've registered to see whether there are any messages. They should also come through as email, but log into Oriel periodically to make sure you don't miss anything. Once the long listing process is completed, you'll get an email to confirm that your application has been put through to the next stage. So next slide, please. So this is just a quick view of the um, final interview process and the kind of relative weightings of each of the sections. So the self-assessment score um, only actually counts for 17 and a half percent. In order to be appointable, you don't need to get any minimum score on that. Any, any score is absolutely fine. The online interview counts for 32.5% and you do need to get a minimum score on that. Um, for the round we've just run, almost all applicants were found appointable. So um, it's not, it, it, it's a good barrier, but it's not unachievable for you. Um, and then CAS score, obviously everyone in the process has passed CAS, so there's no minimum score on that. We adjust the scores so that they're comparable between different days and different um, CAS diets. Um, to make them fair um, and so everyone will start on a minimum of 50% for that. Um, so next slide please. So moving on to the self-assessment domains, this is the same set of self-assessment domains that we've been using for a number of years and there are 10 of them. We've got incredibly detailed instructions on our website which I recommend you read before, before you submit your application. Um, the three I've highlighted in yellow there are time limited um, and I just wanted to make it clear that if you um, have had a career break or you've been working less than full time then um, you can count evidence longer ago than seven calendar years or six calendar years, depending on the um, domain. 
um, you just need to provide a summary of your employment history so that we can see you've been working less than full time or you've, or you've had a period of maternity leave or whatever. So those domains are very similar to what they've been in previous um, rounds of recruitment. The only one that's different um, is domain six. So next slide, please. Um, because it is slightly different, um, I thought I'd just put it up and include it in this slide. Um, so it's been changed slightly so that the kind of focus is on completed audit cycles or quality improvement projects. And ideally we'd like to see um, evidence of, of change on either a national, regional or local level, um, but a completed audit cycle does still attract some points. Um, so next slide, please. So once you, so in your application form, then you'll select the relevant, um, the relevant um, score that suits yourself. Um, and then there'll be a period of time in February where you'll have to upload the evidence um, for each of those domains. So for instance, if you've got a PhD, you need to upload your PhD certificate. And then those scores will be um, verified by, a, by an assessor who will be a consultant psychiatrist trained to look to know what to look for. Um, try as, as hard as you can to make sure you accurately score yourself at the time of application. The whole process will be a lot more straightforward um, if you've thought about the score you can award yourself and that you've got the relevant evidence to show that you do meet that score. Um, try and make it as easy as possible for the assessors to interpret your evidence. And I think a really key point is to remember that you should go for quality over quantity when providing evidence. So for instance, um, in the um, publications section, then you get full marks of your first author in more than one postgraduate peer reviewed publication. So you only need to provide us with two evidence for two and publications to get full marks. There's no extra marks if you happen to have 10. Um, and I, I've already said it, but I'll repeat it again. On our website, there are really detailed instructions about what you should do and kind of to attempt to cover all circumstances. I know though, because we've been doing it for a number of years, there probably are still some ambiguities in relation to the self-assessment. So if you read that and you're still baffled, then please drop us an email. Um, our email address is at the end um, and we'll try and clarify things for you. Um, so next slide, please. So this page is about the online interview. Um, ahead of your online interview, we'll send you a kind of guide of practical considerations like making sure to sit somewhere sensible with a good internet connection and not have any children interrupting, that kind of thing. Um, and then in terms of the interview itself, it lasts around about 15 minutes and it will be held over MS Teams. In the room with you will be two assessors who will be consultant psychiatrists and there might also be a lay rep. You'll be asked to answer two scenarios, which we'll publish in advance of interviews um, on our website, and you get around six minutes on each scenario. Um, you should expect that you'll be prompted and asked probing questions during six minutes on each of, uh, during the six minutes for each of these scenarios. So don't script your response or be heavy, heavily reliant on notes. It is a two-way process. Um, there's also a score awarded for communication, though. Um, I think hopefully to reassure you that the assessors are brief to bear in mind that body language and other things like that might be a bit harder to read virtually and um, particularly if there turn out to be um, any technical issues. Um, so the online interview has been designed to allow you to demonstrate your knowledge of core skills and attributes relevant to SD4 psychiatry um, and also to mean that there's a standardised interview process for all applicants regardless of which SD4 psychiatry specialty you want to be considered for. Um, and so then, yeah, I guess just finally to reiterate, it is a generic interview, but that doesn't mean you can't use specialty specific examples if you wish. Um, so next slide, please. So then the final element of the um, fin your final interview score is made up of your CAS score. So as I've already alluded to, CAS scores, um, that the, we will adjust your CAS score so that they're comparable between diets and between days within specific diets. Um, we'll use a pass mark of 50% for the recruitment process. I think to date all the CASC um, pass marks have been higher than 50%. So that will mean that the mark we use for your interviews will be lower than your mark in, in reality. Um, and I've just given an example there. So if you took CASC on a day when the pass mark was 62%, 62.2% and you scored 62.2%, then your adjusted score would end up being 50% and so on. Um, so um, on a practical level, if you've got your CAS score at the time of application, then we'll ask you to upload it um, when you're applying. Um, if you don't currently have your CAS score because you're taking CAS in January, um, we'll ask you to provide proof of passing later on. Um, if you're concerned you've lost your CAS score, don't worry about that. There's a question on the application form um, and you can give us consent to ask the Royal College um, to provide us with details of your score. So hopefully that covers that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so finally, once we've gone through all those stages, um, 
then we'll move on to the offers process. In terms of when you get the chance to say which posts you're interested in and which areas, um, that should be available from the 24th of February. Um, we've got kind of indicative numbers of vacancies on our website right now, but they will definitely change between now and February. So um, it's really when you get to the preferencing stage that the posts are more kind of set in stone. Um, we're anticipating that we'll make offers during the week commencing the 29th of March. And as standard, you've got 48 hours to respond to your offer. That doesn't include weekends or bank holidays. You get three options up until the 1st of, uh, no, not the 1st of April, 1 p.m. on the 28th of April. You can accept, decline or hold your offer. The hold option really is if you're waiting to hear from another specialty. Um, given that we're now doing ST4 psychiatry as a generic process, um, not, it's not necessarily that likely. So hopefully you'll either be able to accept or decline your offer. Um, relatively quickly. Once initial offers are made, then they're what we call recycled every 48 hours. So basically, if anyone higher ranked than you declines a post, then you might get shuffled up into that post if it's one of your higher ranked posts. Um, and you'll have the opportunity also to update your preferences between each time we recycle um, the offers in case your circumstances have changed or, or you feel like a different specialty would be better for you. Um, if you reject an offer, then this has absolutely but absolutely no bearing on any future applications you may make. Um, basically, each time you apply to us, if you apply more than once, it, it's like a clean slate. We don't look back to what happened in the past. Um, if you want to defer your start date, there is a question in the application form about this, but we don't use it at the recruitment stage. So if you um, accept a post, then you would need to discuss with your new HE region or, or Wales or Scotland about deferring your post. Um, the rules state that you can only defer your start date on statutory grounds, um, so bear that in mind. For August 2020, so the last intake, then there were exemptions to that linked to COVID. It's possible there might be in August 2021 as well, but I can't say for sure that there will be. So currently, deferrals are only for statutory grounds, such as maternity leave or the like. Um, so next slide, please. Um, there are just a few key dates here, which I think I've already gone through in the presentation, so I won't go through them again, but you'll be able to see them either on our website or on these slides later on. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and then, yeah, as you know, you can ask questions now or in the chat later on. If you've got a really specific query that you don't want to share with everyone else or you don't get an answer today, then you're welcome to email us um, and we should be able to get back to you relatively quickly. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, thanks for listening, and I'm going to pass you over to Kabir now. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Um, I am quickly going to try and share my screen now. I hope it is visible. Perfect. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I am Kabir Kirk, and as Luke very generously introduced me earlier, I am a new starter with, as ST4 in Southeast London, and prior to that, I have spent some time uh, in Hertfordshire as an MTI trainee. And basically, this presentation and my talk is about my experiences applying and my experiences as an ST4 so far. Um, a very quick sort of overview of my personal journey in psychiatry so far. I did my primary medical qualification and secondary qualification, which is MD in psychiatry in India, which is comparable to core training here. And then I did a couple of years of what is known as senior residency in India, which is comparable to the ST or the SPR in UK. In 2018, I moved to UK as an MTI, a medical training initiative trainee and worked in Hertfordshire. And my experiences during that time were a combination of CT3 and ST4 level jobs. Um, this was the time when I also cleared my MRC psych exams. This was also the time I got involved with the psychiatric training committees and get in, got in touch with um, Luke and a lot of other very helpful colleagues. And once I had made up my mind to go on to higher training, this year is when I entered the higher training program. So I am someone who would be identified as being on a combined program. And as, as you saw in Claire's presentation, I am someone who uh, submitted the Form C as part of my application. I'm not going to go into the details of my experiences applying to the higher training because that was in the thick of the pandemic and there were changes made. So I did apply on Oriel and then the pandemic uh, sort of took off uh, in, the, in the major way and the recruitment office 
responded to the challenges and went ahead with the recruitment program. Uh, one of the things which I found uh, interesting was the way visa was handled. Uh, I think I benefited and a lot of my colleagues benefited from a very responsive uh, Health Education England office who processed our certificate of sponsorships really quickly. And the home office again, uh, worked really nice in a way that we did not have to go out and a lot of our visa application process was taken care of uh, online and even though there was funnily enough a, a brief period of time where we did not have where i did not have a, a valid visa as per se but the home office had been in touch clearly communicating that the certificate of sponsorship allows us to work and then the medical recruitment office of the trust i work in was very helpful and considerate so quickly moving on to the current job and experiences that I have. I currently work in a split job, which is split half and half between a general adult inpatient unit and a CMHT. And I think how it is different from um, a CT post is that the team and the consultant, there is an expectation to input on a more senior clinician level. And that gives you an opportunity to explore more autonomy, but also being under the under the watchful eyes of your consultant. This is a wonderful opportunity to learn case management skills. And as would be in, in a core training post, you get protected time with your clinical supervisor, which is again um, run by how we feel that uh, is something that is important for us. And we are the ones taking lead of, of the, of the uh, protected supervision time. The on-calls also differ in a bit uh, then the core training on calls, there's more decision making that we get to do. There's more autonomy that we enjoy during these times. We are supporting our first on call colleagues. Uh, we are supporting other out of ask clinicians, for example, the crisis teams or the mental health liaison teams. And we also lie with other medical colleagues in different medical branches all over uh, the trust that you might be working in. And again, what's important is to realize that you are always supported by the on-call consultants. Uh, I know the on-call scenario differs in whichever place you're in, but there's always support, even as a psychiatry hire trainee while on call. I think what's, what's really interesting for me and what's really uh, lucrative for me is the educational side of it, where you have, depending on the variations, uh, protected educational day, you have named educational supervisors, the portfolio, as with co trading, which will help with the ARCPs, there are steady leaves, there are educational budgets. And what's really interesting about psychiatry higher training, which I personally find really helpful, is the spatial interest is where you have one day a week or two sessions a week uh, to explore something of that is of interest to you apart from your uh, day job. And there, there are a lot of opportunities that arise out of this. And there are a lot of things that higher trainees can do as part of their training using the special interest days. There are a lot of leadership and management opportunities. Again, getting involved with the psychiatric training committee as, as Luke introduced in the beginning. Um, the leadership courses that you can go on to, uh, getting involved with the trust higher training uh, committees there are multiple management committees in the trusts that you work in that you can get involved in. So there are a lot of opportunities for us to explore uh, during this higher training period. Again, continuing on, on the same part, research and QI based on one's own preferences, based on one's own requirements. There are a lot of opportunities to get involved with research or submit quality improvement projects, which is again also expected of a higher trainee. And similarly, academics getting involved with academic uh, activities happening in the trust, helping out your fellow uh, colleagues with, for example, even MRC site teaching or getting involved in teaching medical students or uh, other medical or clinical colleagues. Uh, so there are quite a few opportunities that will lead to an all round development of, of a trainee during this time. I think before I hand over to Benji, one thing which I would like to also point out is that psychiatry higher training program is one of the few ones that offers the flexibility of an out of program career break in addition to the, the usual ones, which is the training and the research. And all in all, I think the psychiatry higher training uh, provides us an opportunity to train and explore a lot of 
uh, extra things that that then help us progress in our career. Um, I would be happy to answer the questions that come in today. I can also be contacted on my email and on Twitter. My handle is at Dr. Kabir Kirk, and I'd be very happy to help and to support anyone who's planning to apply to higher training. Um, with that, I would now like to hand over to Benji for his talk. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Benji. I don't have any slides. Apologies for that. I've just been asked to informally talk to you uh, a little bit about why I chose psychiatry and how my career has progressed as a higher trainee. To be honest, when I think about my personal motivation for being a psychiatrist, um, I think I had this fantasy that I was going to come into it. I was going to get the secret, the secret codes to fix my own quite mad family. Um, that is still uh, very much a work in progress. Um, but also at medical school, I was always more interested in philosophy and, and psychology. I did medical ethics in my intercalated degree. Um, and I, I think I embraced the gray areas and there's certainly a lot of uncertainty in, in the field of psychiatry. I've also always been quite creative. And I suppose I'm in that school of thought that likes to think of psychiatry as much as an art as it is really a, really a science. But I, I'm aware that the, the college is doing this webinar because an alarmingly low number of CTs, 14%, progress directly into higher training. Uh, straight after finishing their core training. So I sense there's some ambivalence there or some mixed feeling. Um, and maybe, you know, of, of, of the, the number of people that are on this webinar, maybe some of you that kind of speaks to your experience. Just to say, I really get that. Like I was in that other 86% of people who, who didn't jump straight into higher training. I had that, that break because I, I finished core, core training with very mixed feelings about the, the, the speciality I'd chosen to commit my, my life to. Um, you know, I, I went into medicine wanting to help people, as I think a lot of us do, but psychiatry is unique in the sense that often a lot of our patients they don't they don't think they need our help they don't want our help they don't want our treatments and they will actively run away from us so you can sometimes wonder if you're even really helping anyone at all and i remember i certainly got more chocolates and thank you cards on the medical wards i suppose though in that that year of thinking that i i took out i kind of made my peace with it and, and the way i framed it is yes we are one of the more, the more controversial medical specialities, perhaps the most, the least understood, but we are also the newest. And I try to see that in terms of an exciting thing and the, and the, the room that there is for growth. And already, you know, in my, my short career as a psychiatrist, I feel like we've seen, you know, positive changes for the better. A recent example, I suppose, is it was triggered by the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, the college's acknowledgement about, say, the horrendously disproportionate number of black men, for example, that we, we throw in, that we section, that we diagnose with psychosis, that we throw into PQs and physically restrain, for example. Also, in my short career, I think already I've started to detect a slight societal shift, too. I remember, um, you know, when I was a, a CT1, um, I think I would... Uh, I would like go to a party and if ever I told someone my job, they would make an excuse to leave really quite quickly. Whereas now I sense like anyone with mental health expertise are very much in vogue. Um, and I think you only need to listen to the radio or read the newspapers to see that. I think the pandemic has been helpful in, in that sense, in that, you know, it has put mental health back on the on the national political agenda. And, you know, clearly COVID-19 has affected people's minds as much as their as their bodies. And, you know, just thinking selfishly, I suppose that is quite good for job security of psychiatrists. I, I think unless anyone develops any miraculous cures anytime soon, we probably will definitely have a job for life. Speaking of which, uh, I also think we're quite safe for when the robots come to take away people's jobs. You know, psychiatry is the newest, uh, is the most human medical speciality in the sense that we rely largely on our observations of, sub of subjective patient experiences. We don't yet have the luxury of objective medical investigations. So that's another plus. 
as has already been mentioned, like I suppose a, a perk is so when you you can pick your subspeciality for starters. So be that say CAMS or or general adult or old age or psychotherapy or whatever it is. But then also I think within your subspeciality, you get to become the type of psychiatrist that you would that you would like to be. You've probably already noticed from your core training that psychiatry is a very broad church. Not everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet. So you'll get, you know, one extreme, some quite hardcore biological psychiatrists. And at the other end, you almost get some kind of borderline anti-psychiatrists. Um, and I suppose everyone else who's kind of in between people like myself. But with, with being a higher trainee, I think you do have more autonomy. Uh, to you do have the freedom to practice in a way that you feel more comfortable with or that you feel is, is the most compassionate. Um, special interests at a day that is, I think, exclusive to psychiatry and is an is a amazing opportunity for you to really develop your, your particular interests. Um, so just thinking about how I used mine, I initially saw a couple of psychotherapy patients to hone my psychotherapeutic skills. Um, and then I dabbled in some research and I helped with an RCT looking at uh, the healing powers of magic mushrooms for depression, which I also think is an aside is a, a reason for excitement in psychiatry. I think that could be a potentially revolutionary treatment alternative that hopefully is just around the corner. And yeah, as was said in my, in, in my blurb, I, I suppose more recently, I've been focusing more on medical writing. So trying to communicate more helpful public health messages but to a wider audience either in newspaper articles or with this with this um you know this book deal that i've i've, I've just got now to write a kind of adam k-esque psychiatric memoir which i hope will be an opportunity to be educational myth busting and hopefully boost our profile uh, our specialties profile and also kind of raise the alarm of the crisis that that has always been in in, in the mental health system since I've, since I've been in here, basically. Um, I am less than full time and I've also had UPs and they have always been accommodated. And I think that's a perk. I think, you know, psychiatrists are generally quite an open minded bunch. My supervisors have always been pretty supportive, perhaps in a, in a way that other specialities might not, not have been. Um, thinking about as well, your life outside of the job, uh, I think as you've as you've kind of heard with those competition ratios earlier, you know, there is a bit of a recruitment problem in psychiatry. It's not ultra competitive, but that's a plus if you think like you probably will get a training post in a place that you would actually like to live, um, which is only going to be good for your for your personal well-being. And I think that's not to be underestimated when you you think about the high rates of burnout and dropout and mental health problems and alcoholism and all the rest of it that we now know are associated with doctors today. Um, yeah, on calls, they're different. Uh, you, you do less, as a SPR, you'll do like less kind of menial medical ward jobs and more uh, inverted commas proper psychiatry. You'll hold a bit more responsibility, so you'll be, um, but in a, in a good way, so you'll be giving advice over the telephone to juniors and you can also you'll develop fresh skills, say doing Mental Health Act work. Um, also as an SPR, a lot of the work can be done off site. And if you're lucky, I actually find can be a lot quieter and have a lot more thinking, you have a lot more thinking space than they do on some of the core trainee rotors. Um, speaking of juniors, if you're into mentoring, teaching or lecturing, again, uh, that, is, that is also something that you have the time and I suppose as an SPR, the authority to deliver. And I know a lot, I know a lot of uh, friends do kind of, they'll use their special interest time to do formal uh, qualifications, for example, in medical education. So I think that's probably my time. Um, in summary, I'm not going to sugarcoat psychiatry. I know it's complicated and problematic and has its own unique challenges. But I do think that the victories are there if you look for them. And on balance, my sense is that we are moving in the right direction. And my feeling is also that we're more likely to bring about positive change being in the system than out of it. Um, that's how I rationalize it anyway. I also like to think optimistically that, you know, the chancellors with their promises of, you know, extra money coming in for mental health, that we are getting closer to hopefully parity of esteem with physical health. Um, and on a personal level, you know, I am quite happy in my job. I definitely don't regret choosing it. I find it en endlessly fascinating.
um, yeah, I guess, yeah, just finally, again, if, if anyone has any questions, I'm also a big advocate of the Choose Psychiatry push. I think I'm pretty approachable. Do feel free to reach out on Twitter. My handle is, um, well, I'm just Benji Waterhouse. Feel free to, to reach out on there, but good luck whatever you guys decide to do. And if you choose psychiatry, hopefully see you around. Um, all right, back to Luke. Great. Well, first of all, I just want to thank in order that you've spoken, uh, Claire, uh, Kabir, and Benji for what's just been a really useful and interesting 35 minutes. Um, I hope those of you that are on this Zoom call have found that useful. I know I've learned some things uh, as well uh, from this, this webinar. So firstly, thank you very much for, for your time again. Um, I'm also delighted with the number of questions that we've seen. Uh, I can tell you that there's been over uh, 70 uh, live questions ans asked so far. Many of them have been answered by our team of volunteers behind the scenes, um, but there are a couple that have been highlighted um, that we think would be useful for, for many of you. Um, so Claire, Kabir and Benji, thank you for uh, coming back to now be on our, our panel for the next uh, 15 minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some, some questions that have come up. Um, I will direct them to one of you uh, as I, the person who I think is most relevant for, um, but if uh, anybody else would like to comment at the end, please uh, do feel free uh, to do that. Um, so this first one is for you, Claire, if that's all right. Yep. Uh, and a question came in um, and it was around the quips and the audits and whether data collection uh, would give you any points um, rather than actually being the main author of that particular piece of work. No, it doesn't anymore. So it's only if you've completed a full audit cycle. Okay. Fine. Well, that's a nice quick one. Thank you very much, Claire. And I'm sorry if that's not the answer you wanted uh, for whoever asked that question. Um, another question, actually, Claire, and unsurprisingly, many of them will be will be coming your way. Um, for trainees that are in a CAMS run through post uh, that may wish to do another specialty for their higher training, mm -hmm. um, will they need to resign their run through post to make an application. No, so there would be no need to do that, just apply. And then if you're successful and you decide to take up, so general adult or whatever, then then resign at that point, yeah. So no need to resign in advance. Perfect, good, thank you very much, Claire. Um, another one uh, coming your way, I'm afraid. Um, there's some questions regarding the scenarios for the online interview, mm -hmm. and what they will look like and whether more information will be released about those. Yeah, so we usually um, publish them on our website about a week before the first interviews, and that's still the intention um, to do that this year. Um, we've got some kind of a little bit more information as well about how to prepare and that kind of stuff as well, which we'll put up relatively soon. So they will be available in advance. Great. Thank you very much. And hopefully that's reassuring for, for some of you on this webinar now. Um, there's also been lots of questions actually around trainees that maybe sat the cask uh, a while ago or have never actually sat the cask because they got their membership before. What um, happens uh, to those candidates if they don't have a cask score? Okay so yeah we have a solution for that and I didn't mention it because I wasn't sure it would come up but um, since it has that sign um, when you apply um, you basically need to say that you took the cask even if you didn't take the cask pre 20 2015 we've got each of the diets listed and then it gets to a point where it's like before this that's the option you need to select and then we'll kind of award you a kind of proxy score that is the mean of all the the other scores that we get so we can't tell you exactly what score you'll get now but you will get a fair score to represent um um your effort but we we can't equate it to anything else because it's not it isn't isn't a different style so yeah there is a solution don't worry it doesn't rule you out from applying Okay, thank you for that. And if that um, question, uh, that, that the answer that Claire's given, you've got any questions about that, please do uh, write them back in the Q&A uh, and I will uh, ask Claire a follow-up um, to that if there's any questions after that answer. Um, moving now on to you, Kabir. Um, someone uh, sent in a message um, and they just wanted to know a bit more about what you had done during your MTI years, besides actually, you know, getting the MRC psych to increase your score when you applied for ST4? Ah, thank you, Luke. Um, I think uh, the, the most important thing that I, which I sort of hold on, held on to when I joined the MTI post is what was told to us in the induction that an MTI post is like a training post only without the ARCP. 
So for people who are on that path, on, on that post, what I would suggest is get involved with the, the opportunities that the other trainees get involved with. Um, psychotherapy cases, um, quality improvement projects, audits, uh, getting involved in research that is happening. So any, all those opportunities are still available to us as MTIs, and they do help A, understand the system and help us sort of uh, get an idea of how things are here, but also as, as, we, as we would see help in the recruitment process. Great, thank you very much, um, Kabir, for, for sharing that, sharing that with us. Um, what I'm now going to do is start going through some more of the open questions um, that we have, um, and again, a couple here now for you, Claire. I'm afraid. Um, That's okay. Question um, again around the scoring and what counts for scores or not. Um, a question has come in around uh, writing a paper that's been published, but in a non-PubMed indexed journal. Do you know whether that would, what the criteria are to award yourself the points for uh, articles? Oh, you put me on the spot there. I think, I think you just need to look really carefully at what each of the domains are. I think there possibly are a couple of points you could award yourself for it um, in a kind of non, because I think there's a kind of case report e-letters one. I think it would probably fit into there. Um, but I do think that question will be answered if you read our full set of instructions, I hope. Okay, great. And I guess if it isn't, Claire, um, that, that training email us, can, can definitely. email you first. Yeah. Specific. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question that, that's come up uh, in different kind of guises, I guess, um, uh, over the course of this webinar is around how um, training numbers kind of matches higher training posts and the concern that in some deaneries, there are lots of uh, CT3s, but very few, it looks like at least, ST4 posts, and the disruption that that causes uh, trainees who may have to move to a different area to complete their, their training. Um, I guess people are wondering how that mismatch happens and, and, and how it's looked at. Is that a question to me? Yeah, I think so, Claire. I don't know. Oh, right, <laughs> not sure I can answer. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think that might be true in specific regions and, and specific specialties, but in general, I, I think it works out because lots of people don't go straight into training afterwards. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think the way we're running the new process where all the posts are available in all, the, all across the different specialties, then there's a higher chance that you'll be able to stay in the region where, where, where you currently are. Um, I don't really have a very good answer, I'm afraid. It's not... No. No, Claire, I, th I, I wasn't sure you would, to be honest. But a <laughs> Good. Of, a, couple, a couple of people have asked similar, similar questions, so I thought I'd try. Um, uh, but, but there we go. Thank you for, for trying to, to answer that one. Um, I guess um, bringing Kabir and Benji into this um, now, and Benji, thank you for, I'm sorry you've uh, not had any um, direct questions yet. Um, if you were applying through this new process um, that, that Claire has described today. I wonder, first Benji, if you could, could maybe uh, think and, and answer this, um, how you might go about preparing for it. And if you've got any advice potentially for some of the applicants. Ooh. Um, I don't really think I have beyond what, what sorry, what me and Kabir have just said, really. Sorry. And I'm not also, I apologize. I was worrying about my bit. I wasn't listening to how it differs to when I applied, but when I applied, I think I, I mean, just, I, I suppose I just tried to tick all the, the, the personal specification things that you need to do. So research, audit, communication skills, psychotherapy, whatever that thing was. And then also some extracurricular stuff, which as I've sort of said, I think you can frame always in ways that could also be a benefit to psych your psychiatry application. Okay, no, good. Thanks, thanks for that, Benji. Uh, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, Kabir, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. I think uh, when going through the process of applying uh, a very useful resource is your fellow trainees in, in, in the place that you're in. Uh, I think I personally also benefited quite a lot by talking to the ST4s in my trust, who had just gone through the process. And that also very was very helpful when it came to portfolio because they could point out things that I had, which I did not realize I can use in my portfolios. So I think one of the really important things that can happen is talk to the trainees in your trust, talk to the people who just passed through the ST4 process, and they would be much more clued in and be helpful. And I think that's 
uh, one of the ideas that I would give to anybody who's looking forward to applying. No, absolutely. Thanks, Kieran. I think that's a really good good point. Getting to getting in contact with with people. Um, Claire, a couple of uh, technical questions now again regarding the application process, if that's all right. Um, question has come in uh, regarding the. Um, length of time that that the application says to have done things, for example, like um, audits and things, mm -hmm. is that process is that timeline extended if you're a less than full times trainee? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So if you want to rely on evidence that's older than um, the the calendar amount of time ago, it should be from. Um, that's absolutely fine. You just need to make sure you provide a summary of your employment history. So to show that you've been working less than full time for however long or to say that you've been on maternity leave or whatever, um, upload that with your self-assessment evidence so that it's obvious why, why you're adding stuff that's alleged that's, uh, like on the face value of it out of date. So you won't be disadvantaged. Great. But you do need to provide that information, the summary of your employment history. Perfect. Thank you. And the same, a, another uh, technical question regarding what's the definition of regional work versus maybe national. I'm wondering if there's a set definition to that that you're aware of. I don't think there is a set definition because it depend on, it depend, I mean, there's so many different ways that could be interpreted. I mean, I think, I think you will probably know. I mean, I think, for instance, when the college does stuff, it's relatively obvious whether it's the Royal College or whether it's like a division of the Royal College, isn't it? So if it's a division, I would think that's regional. If it's the Royal College as itself, then I think that counts as national. Um, but yeah, there probably is some ambiguity there. Okay, fine. Um, and I guess if people have questions regarding that, if they're wanting to make sure they're accurately giving themselves the correct scores, can they contact the office, your office, to get some clarification maybe? We, we can definitely give an opinion on it. Um, yes. Um, I, I, I mean, I think when the um, when your evidence is verified, then whoever is verifying it will put comments. So they'll say like, well, I thought, you know, this says RC Psych Divisional. So I've given you that award rather than that award so that the score will end up being adjusted. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think you'll know best yourself whether it is or isn't regional or, or national. So we can try and give advice, but I think also probably hopefully know the answer yourself <laughs> no absolutely thank you claire and um in terms of those types of projects again if people are planning on finishing them in december january time can people put that on on the form to get scores or do the projects have to have completed when they submit the application i think you need to read the domains really carefully so the one that's relating to um quip and audits says by december 2020 so you would need to have completed it by the closing date for applications um the others they're not so they're not quite so specific but if you don't have the evidence to upload by the closing date for that upload which is the, is february then it won't be able to be counted so it does need to be completed okay fine thank you for that clarification um a question for you now benji uh, if that's all right um uh, someone on the the webinar has said um are there any non-london cities or trusts that are recommended by you for doctors with a creative background for example in film writing or music Ooh, um i i'm so sorry i couldn't couldn't say because i couldn't really comment i've only i did my core training here and my higher training here but I think there is, um, I think you'd be surprised. I think you can find your tribe within psychiatry quite easily, actually, once you get in there. And if you find like-minded people, there's also a kind of underground network as well that I'm part of, which, which uh, maybe think a little bit more differently to an entirely biological way of thinking about psychiatry called the Critical Psychiatry Network. That's another thing that personally I found very helpful in helping me to progress through my training. So um, give that a Google as well yeah great no thank you for that benji um really helpful i hope that answers the the question uh, to the person that, that asked that um back to you now claire i gave you a break um Thanks. I, i'm wondering um if you know when the indicative vacancy numbers for august will will be released uh, and where they will be viewed um, yeah they're on our website at the moment so um it's the northwestern deanery website what well what used to be um the link is in in my presentation um there's a st4 psychiatry section and there's a current round section and there's um like a pdf of there of the current vacancies which i think are as of two weeks ago um great they're Thanks. still in range format so they're not completely definite at this point in time but they're there and just as a follow-up question claire that may come through then when do the numbers actually get confirmed 
Well, it just quite late on. Basically, at the point we make offers, we're certain that we've got those posts to offer. But each region has to kind of tell us and it will be dependent on what's happening in their own local training schemes as to when people um, CCT or, or leave or that kind of thing. So the, it, the numbers can be quite fluid until quite late in the day. But by the point we offer you a post, that post will exist, certainly. Great, thank you for that. And uh, just another, we've probably got time for, for me to ask uh, a couple more, I think. Um, someone has asked whether they need to produce a CV um, and they've not seen yet that it's a requirement. Um, I guess it would be useful to know for people to know by the looks of it. No, there's no requirement to, to, to include a CV. Um, you need to complete the application form. Um, and, is, and if, as I was previously saying, um, for the self-assessment evidence, you want to count experiences a bit longer ago, you need to provide a summary of your employment history, but there's no requirement to have a CV as such. Great, thank you. And that probably leads on actually to, to another question that's been asked about employment history. Um, in the application, it talks about working years often when it's mm -hmm. cut off. Does working years count uh, as a medical student or are you talking uh, FY1? Um, I think we mean postgraduate, so yeah, F1 onwards. Fine, thank you for that. Um, and uh, this, I think, is a question that's just come in that comes up all, all of the time, actually. Um, are there less or more numbers usually in February to August? Is there a, usually a pattern? Um, do you know? I think, so there are more applicants for August intakes, and so there probably are more posts because probably more people start in August and hence finish in August. Um, but actually, because of the circumstances uh, in ST4 psychiatry where not all posts fill all the time in most rounds there's a decent level of posts in most regions and most specialties for both August and February is my impression yeah. Right perfect okay thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just wondering as we've only got a couple more more minutes um, to go if um, anybody from the panel who have given up the time have, have got anything else they'd like to say just to to finish up the the panel discussion today. Benji, looks like that's a no. Two psychiatry. Two psychiatry, but only if it's the right, you know, the right decision for you. There's no point, um, you know, uh, twisting your, your arm. I think you've got to do what feels right for you. But um, yeah, if it feels right, go for it. Thank you very much, Benji. Kabir? Uh, nothing more specific to add. Just to say that there are quite a, quite a lot of opportunities in higher training. And if psychiatry is for you, then definitely go ahead and choose psychiatry because it's, it's, it's an enriching career. Great. Thank you very much, Kabir. And anything finally from you, Claire? Um, I guess just to say, um, read the guidance that we put out, because I think there is loads of information in there and it will answer a lot of your questions. Um, but then don't be shy about asking us questions once you've read that, if, if they don't answer your questions. Um, and yeah, good luck with your application. Great. Well, um, I think it's probably time to bring uh, this webinar to a close, I'm afraid. Uh, that was a very quick hour. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, all of the panel, uh, Claire, Kabir and Benji, uh, for giving up their time and sharing some very personal experiences as well of their training. Um, I'm really grateful that you, you've done this. Um, you know, you, you were asked uh, and you didn't need to be asked twice. All of you came back first time and said yes. So I, I'm really grateful uh, and thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, I also want to thank the college. As I said, uh, when I started um, this webinar, um, the college uh, is an amazing uh, beast. Uh, it is incredibly supportive to trainees. Uh, and I'm very grateful for all of the work that goes on behind the scenes uh, to put on this webinar, to get all of us on here and get the tech working and doing everything that goes with it. It's an awful lot of work. Um, so I just really want to thank the college uh, and the staff for, for doing that. And of course, HEE as well, um, Claire, um, for being here as well and, and participating today. Uh, and finally, uh, my last thanks goes to you. Thank you for attending and engaging with us today. Um, if you have any further questions, please do contact either HEE or the college and do keep your eyes out on the website for the answers to the questions that we haven't managed to get round to today. On behalf of the PTC, I wish you all the best with your applications if you're applying and hope to see you again at a future event over the coming year. Thank you and good night from me. <laughs>